This is one of our planet's biggest rivers. Yet it's still a mystery. It flows from the heart of Asia to the Pacific Ocean and separates two superpowers, Russia and China. Its sprawling network of waterways connects some of the most diverse and largest habitats on Earth. Vast sprawling grasslands, unbroken tracts of pristine forest, rich with wildlife, haunting moonscapes created by volcanic fire and steaming subtropical jungles. This river's floodplains seem to go on forever, creating an untamed wetland wilderness and a river basin bigger than Alaska. This is no ordinary river. It's a vast sprawling network of streams, lakes and bogs. A waterscape of continental scale. The Amor, Asia's Amazon. In Russia, there's a place where it's impossible to tell where a river ends and the sea begins. It's where the Amor meets the Pacific Ocean in a slow perpetual dance between river, sea and sky. It's the ocean's clouds that help the river flow. And it's the river's freshwater bounty that keeps the ocean alive. The Amur flows into the Tartar Strait, which links the Sea of Japan with the Ohotska Sea, one of the richest fishing grounds on Earth. Sunny days are few and far between along this coast. But for many creatures, this place is very inviting. The rhythm of the river governs all life in this ecosystem. Every four years, animals gather on the beaches around the estuary, eagerly awaiting a special event. The seals are patient, knowing they have front row seats for what's to come. The bears are tense, hoping for first dibs on the bounty in the best channel. As the seals patrol the entrance to the bay, savvy gulls know to stick with the bears. But nothing happens yet. Then, out of the blue, a vanguard appears. This river mouth is the halfway house for an epic journey. All of a sudden, the shallows begin to boil and bubble. After four years, the biggest all-you-can-eat banquet begins. After the front line, they come in waves. Hundreds of thousands of humpback salmon. They will spend a few days here as their bodies adjust from salt to fresh water. Several migratory Pacific salmon species come to the coast at different times and different seasons. Some of the fish swim up the Amor River itself, but most prefer small mountain streams around the estuary.
The seams at the mouth of the Amur resemble those in Alaska, nearly 5,000 kilometers to the east. There's plenty for everyone, but the brown bear mothers still protect their cubs from the greedy chaos at the river. With too many big males around, she feels uneasy when they come too close. These are Surrey brown bears, a close cousins to the grizzlies found in Alaska and the common brown bear found across Europe. For a mother bear, losing sight of her cub, even for a minute, could end in tragedy. Unlike Alaska, here there is yet another threat to worry about. The Russian Far East is the realm of the Amur tiger. His breakfast could very easily be a small bear cub. This wild rocky gulf is a crossroads. The Amur's mighty freshwater flow blends with the salty sea. Here, subtropical and polar ocean currents meet. The resulting mist and fog, feared by ships, sends massive amounts of moisture inland. Prevailing easterly winds push these clouds thousands of kilometers, where they rain down heavily on the mountain ranges of Northeast Asia, nurturing its dense woodlands. For nearly a thousand kilometers, a journey down the Amur is a journey south, running parallel to the Pacific coast. Hemmed in by mountain ranges, this massive river runs very deep here. In a land without roads, rivers have long been the only transport routes for indigenous people and colonists, either through water or on ice. And the Amur is not just a transit route for humans. In the autumn, chum salmon travel up the main river for nearly 1,000 kilometers. Some of the individuals battling this current have traveled over 15,000 kilometers. At confluence after confluence, groups of salmon leave the main river and turn into the tributaries flowing down from the mountains. Up near the Pacific watershed, these clear gravelly mountain streams offer perfect spawning grounds. The chum salmon are returning to their birthplace to breed. And they're expected. Mating is literally the last thing on a salmon's mind. Sex and death are almost simultaneous. When they do finally spawn, these powerful fish give up on life. These fast-flowing, shallow headwaters near the Pacific watershed are rich in oxygen, perfect for eggs and the young fry. The females choose a good spot in the gravel and clean out the sand. Then they release thousands of eggs to be fertilized in the water. 
By the time the eggs hatch, the parents will be dead. The fry will then travel down the Amur River back to the Pacific. In four years, they'll be back again. The arrival of such a plentiful supply of protein is a boon to the local wildlife. A real bonus for a mother brown bear with three hungry cubs to feed. No fishing skills are needed when the river serves up fresh salmon all along its banks. Finally, mum can eat in peace. However, the sibling's meal is anything but peaceful. It seems the more there is to eat, the greedier they get. The many rivers that flow down from the Sokotia Lean coastal range in northern Russia have ancient names. Kor, Bikin, Anhui. Echoing the languages of the people who have lived here for thousands of years. These wooded hills of Russia's far east boast one of the planet's last realms of true wilderness. Ironically, it's the presence of humans here that preserves the land's wildness. Their main indigenous community, Krasny Yar, lies on the Bikin River on the edge of the vast woodlands. These indigenous people have lived off this land for many thousands of years, with little impact on nature. They are Udige, a tribe of hunters, and it's they who are making a stand against wholesale exploitation and destruction of natural spaces. Away from tarmac roads, railways and cities, the Udige are self-sufficient. Nothing is wasted. Even the wrecks of off-road vehicles have a second life as barricades against wild boar and bears. But many of the younger generation don't see their future here and often trade the harsh life on the edge of the wilderness for what they hope will be a better life in a Russian city. The wilderness begins on the very edge of the Udige village with the Bikin River as the only access. The misty mountain woods along this river are the haunt of amber. That's what the Udige call the Amor tiger. Since time immemorial, amber and the Udige have shared these hunting grounds. Their respect has always been mutual. This ancient culture with its deep and subtle understanding of nature is anything but primitive. But today, it's on the wane. The forest still feeds the Udige. 
Just like the salmon rivers, the forest has a four-year cycle of its own. And this is a boom year in the Bikin forest. The boom begins right here, in the tops of the Korean pines. In such a year, all the forest inhabitants profit. Humans and animals alike. Amber always knows what's going on in his realm. And the Udige are aware that tigers are nearby. But they would never hurt each other. Korean pines have to be a hundred years old before they produce large amounts of fruit. Each year there are some cones, but every fourth year there are cones galore. It's the delicious seeds in these cones that make the Korean pine precious. A single tree will produce around 20 kilograms. That's nearly half a ton per acre. Tigers depend on the many animals that feed off the oil-rich pine nuts. After a good pine year, the boar population explodes. As do populations of chipmunks, voles and other creatures. Some meat eaters, like this sable, skip the main course and go straight for the pine nuts. Pine nuts are good income for this family. Apart from ginseng roots, there's not much else out here that can be harvested. So this self-made pine cone mill is a money machine. A day's harvest will fetch a few hundred dollars in Havarosk, the nearest city on the bank of the Amor. But what sounds like quick money will have to last for a while. Laying up good winter supplies is vital for the chipmunks as well. There'll be lots of young chipmunks next summer. An Udige hunter would never kill a tiger. That would bring great misfortune. Though when the harvesters are gone, Amber reaffirms that this is his domain. Just beyond the watershed of the Great Amor River, by the Pacific Ocean, the Sikotia Lean mountain range drops straight down to the sea. These cliffs are inaccessible to most, except for one master cliff climber, the Goral. Most ungulates can run fast to escape predators. But Gorals are different. They move slowly, steadily, and consider every step they take. For a Goral, there's no room for a misstep. Gorals also live in similar terrain in the Himalaya and other rugged mountain ranges of Asia. This isolates already dangerously small populations. On a geological time scale, these cliffs are young. Not so long ago, this coastal range was a volcanic island arc in the Pacific Ocean. 
but the Pacific plate beneath the seafloor is moving westward, slipping under the continent. In this process, islands are being pushed against the edge of the continent. This is how the old Amor River was forced northward, adding another thousand kilometers to its flow. The plant life of the Sikotia lean woodlands is incredibly diverse, more so than anywhere else in the temperate zone across the planet. The monsoon sends ample rain, and the rugged land creates microclimates for both subtropical and subarctic trees. In October, many animals start to bed down for the winter. Rivers still flow, but not for much longer. Once the wind turns, icy polar air will rush in from the north and put life on hold. The mountain peaks are first to feel the Arctic freeze as the northerly winds blow the snow clouds in. A male Siberian grouse takes a last stand against winter and marks his mating ground for next spring. of snow is not unusual here. In winter, temperatures drop way below zero, down to minus 40 degrees. On the ocean side of the Sakoti Aline coastal range, Winter is half as harsh, with much less snow, and temperatures rarely dropping below minus 25 degrees Celsius. The Pacific Ocean is a gigantic heat store. Warm water flows in from the south, heating up the icy air flowing down from the Arctic along a narrow strip of land on the coast. Seeker deer are drawn to this coast from far and wide for the warmth and for a special edible treat. The surf brings in kelp, a giant algae that forms vast forests underwater. Full of minerals and salty to taste, these little deer find this seafood irresistible. Their bodies need the minerals, so they take risks. But they're vulnerable out here in the open. Danger lurks at the forest edge. This tigress knows the trails the seekers take back up into the woods. She's followed the deer to the coast and now waits for them to return to the forest and pathways from the cliff edge. In the woods by the Amur River in northern Russia, the seeker deer are extra vulnerable in the deep snow. They can't run fast. But for a surprise attack, a hunter needs to get close.
The sudden silence tells the rest of the herd that they're safe. For now. The tigress doesn't eat too much. Two hungry cubs are waiting back in the woods. The young tigers are almost fully grown, but they still depend on their mother's hunting skills. Crows and magpies often give away a tiger's presence. The second cub arrives. The siblings have to eat before the meat freezes. Even with their sharp teeth, they still find it hard to tear the skin. It'll be another year before they can fend for themselves. The mother tiger is not just feeding her family. When the land is frozen, other creatures depend on her kills. The white-tailed eagle is normally a fish hunter, but in winter he's forced to scavenge with ravens, magpies and any other hungry little meat-eater around. Without these carcasses left by the tiger, they'd go hungry throughout winter. For the majestic eagle, such meals come at the cost of dignity. This is not the sort of company he would normally keep. Most of the Amor River, its tributaries and its wetlands, are now sealed with ice. Ice is solid, around a meter thick, and hacking through it is not easy. The real challenge is knowing where to hack, and to be able to sit patiently in the bitter cold for hours while the hole keeps freezing over. river flow and the habits of fish, which makes a successful fisherman. The Nanai people have always lived off the river, eating, selling and making almost everything out of fish, including garments and fish skin gloves. The Amor River has fed many generations and still feeds millions today. The Nanai or river people as they're called have abandoned many of their old ways. Their numbers have declined. Their language has nearly vanished. Their future is linked to that of the Amor River, where over-exploitation is threatening their way of life. But in the bitter cold, their fireplaces still provide a warm place to go here on the far eastern frontier.
By late April, the Amur River is beginning to show signs of change. A strong undertow is nibbling at the edges of the first openings in the ice. Now the white-tailed eagle can reclaim his dignity on the river. As top predator. The ice begins to stir as the river rises. Gently at first, but soon it becomes an unstoppable force. The ice heaves and begins to break up. Thousands of meters of ice are set in motion. The Amur River looks like a gigantic conveyor belt dwarfing all the freight trains of the Trans-Siberian Railway. For weeks, the strange sound of drifting river ice signals the start of spring. But along the river's northern tributaries, winter hangs on a little longer. By the end of May, the wetlands come alive. The long silence is broken. Millions of Dibovsky's frogs are busy producing millions more Dibovsky's frogs. They don't waste time on lengthy courtship. Mandarin ducks, however, are not quite so hasty. This female needs a few reminders that spring's clock is ticking. The trick is to push her underwater for a while. Seems to work for ducks and frogs. Now it's time for a snack. At this time of year, it's easy to catch an otherwise engaged frog. But the difficult bit is finishing the meal before the next potential mate flies by. Nightly frosts are done now, but the buds of alders and Mongolian oak still aren't blooming yet. The sun starts to warm the forest floor. So wildflowers like the Amor Adonis and Boreal Starflower beckon to the first insects. Morning mists bring moisture to the dried out woods along the river. And the floodplains come alive. All plants and animals inhabiting the vast Amur Valley have to cope with several floods each year. And the first one comes with the snowmelt that starts way upstream. 
Floodwaters lap at the Amor's banks and carry an enormous sediment load downstream. Flood after flood, the riverscape changes its face. When the floods recede, large sand islands are exposed. These sands have come all the way from Mongolia, from Korea, and from the mountains way up north in Siberia. This is what the terns have been waiting for. Sand and sun is all they need to breed. In the middle of the river, their clutches are safe from wild boar, foxes or raccoon dogs. But nothing here is ever safe from the whims of the water. Growing up and learning to fly on the sandy banks of the Amur River is a race against time. The rising water is always a threat. The high watermark reveals which clutches were laid by young, inexperienced pairs. This youngster has escaped the river, but he's heading towards another danger. Unwittingly, he trespasses on one of the no-go zones that surround each nest. Breeding pairs won't tolerate other offspring in their space. No exceptions are made. Mission completed. Even after the brutal attack, this chick is among the lucky ones. But there are also years when the Amor takes a greater toll on their population. Deep channels between the islands are the haunt of a river monster. The Amor Kuluga of the sturgeon family is one of the largest of freshwater fish and lies in wait for smaller fish on the river bottom. Old individuals can weigh one ton and reach a length close to five meters. Because its unfertilized eggs are a prized delicacy in luxury markets across the world, the Amor Kaluga has been hunted to near extinction. It is now endangered and legally protected. For nearly 5,000 kilometers, no dam slows down its flow, and nothing curbs the winding of one of the planet's last naturally dynamic waterways. Only two bridges span its breadth. The bridge at Havarovsk was built at the turn of the millennium, replacing the Trans-Siberian Railway Bridge built in 1916. The construction of the Trans-Sib and the foundation of the river port at Havarovsk express Russia's determination to stay on the Amur. For better or for worse, 
but clearly for a while. The world's longest railway line, over nine and a half thousand kilometers, finally linked Russia's far eastern outposts to Europe. All the cargo, civilian travelers, and troops moving between Vladivostok and Moscow passed over this bridge. Thanks to the Transib, the old Cossack military base on the south bank of the Amur River boomed into a frontier city. When the Russian general and governor Muraviev signed a border treaty between the Russian Empire and China's Qing dynasty, he cannot have imagined today's urban sprawl in the middle of the Amur wilderness. Today, one century after the first bridge was built across the Amur, Havarovsk is a modern city, numbering more than half a million Russians from all over the former Soviet Union. This frontier town, located at the confluence of two border rivers, the Amur and the Usuri, marks the border between Russia and China. Perhaps inspired by the way the river slowly rides, like a creature from an ancient legend, here the Amur gets its Chinese name. Heilong Jiang, the Black Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> 